President Kennedy took an interest in the films we were making, and I would receive an occasional phone call from him. He, he'd call me to say, I think you ought to enter that film in the Academy Awards. Welcome to Story and Craft. Now, here's your host, Mark Preston. Well, hello there. How are you? Good to have you here. I'm Mark Preston. This is Story and Craft. Uh, if this is your first time, thank you for checking out the show. If you're coming back, uh, you've been checking out previous episodes. Well, gosh darn it, thank you for uh, coming back by. I appreciate it. I love the fact you're uh, liking the show and checking out my mischief. Uh, today, uh, it, this is a cool episode. Um, I mean, they're all cool episodes, of course, but this one's special, I think. I'm talking with an actual bona fide Hollywood legend. His name is George Stevens, Jr. Uh, he has spent 70 years working in Hollywood as a, a writer, a producer, a director. Uh, he has done all kinds of things uh, that are that in and of themselves would be cool. I mean, he founded the American Film Institute, the AFI. Uh, he co-created the Kennedy Center Honors. He's consulted uh, and been friends with presidents all the way back to John F. Kennedy uh, through President Obama, who actually appointed him to be the co-chair of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities. Um, he's also gotten literally so many awards, I don't have time to list them all here, but just generally he's won numerous Emmys, Writers Guild, Peabody Awards, even got an Oscar and an uh, uh, honorary Oscar for his lifelong contributions to the film industry. This was an absolutely wonderful chat. I had a great time talking with George. He's got a new book, by the way, recounting all of uh, uh, the great things he's done, um, all the stories he has to tell. It is called My Place in the Sun. It is in bookstores and on Amazon and all that jazz. So, uh, by the way, don't forget about storyandcraftpod.com. Easy, easy way to find out everything that I've got going on with the show, uh, social media links. Uh, you want to send me a message. You can also send me a, a voicemail. Uh, well, just anything Story and Craft. Go to the site, storyandcraftpod.com. And uh, thank you so much again for being here. It means a lot to me, and, uh, and I've been getting some really nice messages also. And if I haven't had a chance to reply to you just yet... Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, okay, let's get after it. Uh, today, it is Hollywood Legend Day. It is George Stevens Jr. Day right here on Story and Craft. Where are you joining me from today? Washington, D.C., in my, our house in Georgetown. Now, are you from D.C., or did you grow up somewhere else? I, I, I was born in the Hollywood Hospital. I'm a fifth-generation so. Californian. You know, I did see something that even your grandparents were... Uh, in the industry. Now, was this something that was sort of destiny for you or it was always in the DNA or did you have other aspirations, other things you uh, wanted to do when you were coming up? I was a great admirer of um, Grantland Rice and Red Smith. I wanted to be a sports writer um, and uh, I loved uh, baseball and basketball and golf and yeah. uh, and, and then when the year I graduated from high school, I didn't have a summer job. And my father said, you can help me. <clears throat> and he gave me t two assignments. One was to break down Theodore Dreiser's An American Tragedy, parts one and two, uh, the great the classic novel, uh, and put him in notebooks, all the details, because he was about to start the screenplay of A Place in the Sun based on those uh, on that book. And the other was to read stuff, the scripts and books that came from Paramount that they were proposing for movies. And it was pretty much treacly love stories that were not too appealing to a 17-year-old on hot summer afternoons. Uh, and one afternoon, I picked up this book and read it in the afternoon and went over to see my father that night. And he was reading in bed. And, and I, I, I held it up and I said... Dad, this is a great story. You ought to read it. And he said, why don't you tell me the story? And so I found myself pacing around his bed, trying to tell him the story of Shane, which I had read in Jack Schaefer's novel that afternoon. And uh, I realize now that him offering me these two assignments was a way of letting me find out whether I had an aptitude or an interest in his profession. And 
by the next summer, I was in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, with the job of company clerk on the location for the shooting of Shane. It was my first experience uh, on a movie. Now, of course, your father, George Stevens Sr., um, he wasn't the first person uh, in your in your family who was in this industry. Uh, I think it went, I believe, all the way back, if I'm not mistaken, to your grandparents, who I believe were uh, actors as well, correct? Our, that family history that I really crystallized in my mind in the writing of this book um, was uh, my great-grandmother was Georgie, Georgia Woodthorpe, and she was a great actress on the stage in San Francisco and the youngest Ophelia to the great Edwin Booth's Hamlet, the greatest Shakespearean actor of all time. And her daughter was my father's mother. Um, but Georgia Woodthorpe started five generations of Stevens's in show business. And then my mother's mother, Alice Howell, was a silent film comedian, a big star. Now, of course, you, you had your father to speak with. I mean, when it comes to I, pretty much anything in the industry, but uh, considering that you had grandparents who were also uh yeah, in the industry, did you have access to them to kind of pick their brain as well on just whatever questions you had or just uh, kind of to satisfy your curiosities about the film industry? They were around, but sadly, I never spoke to them about it. Uh, I was really hard, hardly conscious that they were actors. Uh, but uh, an important experience for, for, for me was when I graduated from high school, again, I, I was supposed to go into the Air Force and the Korean War ended, so I had an empty dance card, and my father uh, invited me to join him with the two writers, and and the four of us would sit every morning and work on the screenplay of Giant. So I spent eight months with a kind of a master class in screenwriting uh, as I listened and pitched in occasionally as this, kind of, this masterful screenplay was developed that uh, supported a film that has really stood the test of time. And of course, uh, if memory serves, that was a um, that was a big one for Rock Hudson, uh, correct? It was it was Rock Hudson and Elizabeth Taylor and James Dean, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know it, it is a classic that has uh, uh, made it through the years. My father always. Uh, kind of believed in this idea of the test of time, that a picture is really measured by uh, by how it lasts rather than how fashionable it might have been in the year it came out. That kind of brings me to uh, another question I had for you, because you've had this really uncanny opportunity, this uh, very unique opportunity to, uh, from a front row seat, to see the evolution of film uh, in the U.S., um, just in general terms, I'm, I'm curious, how do you think film has evolved, or, or really more to the point, what do you think film means um, in, in a, as an art form, just kind of generally? Well, I, I, w I would say, looking at it from here in the United States, uh, you know, film is, is, is the most wonderful messenger the United States has had, and I think one of the reasons we were so long thought of as a leading country in the world was everybody was seeing American movies. My father, uh, I remember him saying he was in combat, uh, led the combat photography during the world in, uh, war in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. And he said that when the French people would see these GIs and they all talked like Jimmy Stewart and Henry Fonda and they <laughs> immediately loved them. And so um, we have this wonderful calling card uh, not always the most uh, salutary vision of America, but overall, uh, for generations, people saw and understood the United States through its movies. You know, that's not the first time I've heard that, actually. That's uh, kind of a, a unique way that I think people overseas have had insight uh, into uh, American culture, without a doubt. Now, you know, of course, beyond working with your father, uh, uh, and spending time and, and learning from him. Uh, when did you actually start collecting a paycheck working in the uh, working in this industry and um, and and creating and doing uh, things, uh, creating your own projects? After I got out of the Air Force and I worked on the editing of Giant with my father, and then I was kind of on the pavement looking for work. 
And Jack Webb, who uh, was the creator and star of Dragnet and also made several movies, uh, gave me a job as, as an assistant. And I started working with Jack Webb. And after about a year and a half, he said, I think you ought to be a director. And he he assigned a pilot for me to direct that starred his colleague, Ben Alexander. And the pilot was never sold. But then I started directing uh, episodic television for Jack Webb. And then I had the opportunity to direct Alfred Hitchcock Presents and Peter Gunn. And uh, that was really my start, and I, actually at a very young age. I, it was 25 when I started directing those programs. Now, back then, were your contemporaries, uh, were most of them roughly in the same age range as you, or or were the people creating and directing and um, running the show, as it were, were they mostly people with gray hair? Oh, the, well, I, I greatly admired the friends of my father, Fred Zinneman, uh, uh, Ruben Mamoulian, King Vidor, uh, Frank Capra, William Wyler, John Ford. Uh, I, I was tremendously influenced by them. But uh, the people running the studios were uh, certainly a generation older. Now, in your early career, I mean, that obviously was very advantageous to have your father be who he was. I'm sure it managed to get some doors open for you that uh, gave you the opportunity to show what you were capable of. And you then evolved throughout the years and, and created uh, some things which were kind of uniquely your own, like the uh, American Film Institute. Uh, I was hoping you could touch a little bit on your evolution, you know, how you went from uh, working with your father to creating your own thing, as it were. Yeah, well, I, I, I've written a book called My Place in the Sun, Life in the Golden Age of Hollywood and Washington, in which I talk about the transition in my life, which was... I was happily enjoying my career in Hollywood. I had finished working with my father as the associate producer on The Diary of Anne Frank, and and I directed the location scenes, and we were about to start The Greatest Story Ever Told. And Ed Murrow, Edward R. Murrow, had been appointed by President Kennedy to run the United States Information Agency. And uh, Murrow and I met by uh, coincidence, really, and the next thing I knew, he'd invited me to come back and join him and run the uh, motion picture division of USIA. And that brought me into the world of Kennedy's new frontier. Well, Edward R. Murrow, that, that, he's just uh, definitely on the Mount Rushmore of American journalists. I mean, that, that, that must have been a wonderful connection to make. How, how did you uh, come to meet Edward R. Murrow? And, it, it, and when Kennedy was elected... Uh, it, it, a friend of mine and I at 20th Century Fox had an idea. As a public service, we wanted to make a film of Jacqueline Kennedy's trip to India that had been announced, and we wrote to Ed Murrow proposing it. And before we got a reply, we learned that Murrow was coming to speak to the film industry at Chasen's Restaurant on a Sunday evening, and it was all the moguls and the big directors and stars. And we sent a message to Murrow saying, well... You know, it is the new frontier. Would you like to meet some younger people? <laughs> and and he accepted. On on a Friday afternoon at the Directors Guild, uh, Paul Newman was there, Richard Zanuck, uh, Stuart Stern, and writer. A group of us, about a dozen, met with Murrow. And we had a conversation about how uh, we thought we might help with the new frontier. And uh, the next day I got a call from Sam Goldwyn, Jr., he said, "My Ed Murrow is staying at my father's house, and he wonders if you could come by and meet with him on Sunday. And uh, I went by to see Ed Murrow, and we had a wonderful talk, and he asked me to come take this job running the uh, motion picture operation, making 300 documentaries a year. Holy cow, that's 300 documentaries a year. I mean, you must have had a, uh, a nice staff of uh, collaborators or... Uh... Uh, people helping you to put this together. Well, and and I enlisted, unlike World War II, when Frank Capra and my father and uh, uh, William Wyler, John Houston all left their studios to go work for the war. Uh, I couldn't call on them, so but we found wonderful young filmmakers, and we were very successful. Uh, 
and made Academy Award winning films and, and films that really served the country abroad. Now, for the most part, what was your focus, uh, the, the, the subject matter or genre, whatever have you, of, uh, of the documentaries that you were producing? Well, one area was uh, putting a, 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 an, an honest but, and more informed face of the uh, civil rights movement in the United States. Uh, the, there was... You know, the images seen abroad were of police dogs attacking uh, African-Americans. And we made films. Uh, one was called Nine from Little Rock, which is a story of the nine uh, students who went into Little Rock High School at, and had the uh, National Guard there to get them through the door. And that was directed by Charles Guggenheim and told the story of these nine children and, and where they went after Little Rock High. And that uh, did win the Academy Award. And we made another one on the March on Washington in 1963. It was directed by James Blue, and that told the story of that wonderful day when uh, black and white Americans, hundreds of thousands of them, came together to uh, call out for, for jobs and freedom. Now, of course, you, you kind of carried that theme forward um the film about Thurgood Marshall, the uh, separate but equal, uh, with Sidney Poitier. Um, and it kind of brings me to another point, uh, or another question, rather. When you were kind of coming into your own and, and directing these films with these stars who would become, I mean, Hollywood icons, what was it like collaborating early on uh, in creating films with these, uh, these uh, uh, really talented actors? And did you know at the time that they were going to become who they were. I mean, Sidney Poitier is a wonderful example of that. Uh, uh, I'm so glad you asked, uh, Mark. But Sidney is one of the great figures of our time and a, a wonderful person. And he was really the only actor who could had the weight to get enable us to do a mini-series ab about separate but equal, which was the story of the desegregation of schools and the Supreme Court decision that outlawed it, all engineered by Thurgood Marshall. And Sidney played Thurgood. And, and I guess from my standpoint, I'd been around my father and around my father with actors, and I kind of absorbed, I think, a lot of his technique, which was really to be... Uh, very straightforward with the actors to speak very softly with them not talk about them not talk to them or cor correct them in front of other actors to always take them aside and Sidney was just a you know such a, a, a talent and, and also in that film was Burt Lancaster another uh, kind of film icon and, and Burt was a little more temperamental than Sidney but uh, we all got along great, and it was a, and we won the uh, Emmy for the best miniseries for Separate but Equal. Well, if I'm not mistaken, didn't you also turn that into a uh, stage play as well? well it, it's it was, and several years later. I, I was having dinner. My wife and I were having dinner with Sidney and Joanna, his wife, and as we sat down at, at the restaurant, and I said, "Well, well, you know, what's going on?" And Sidney had kind of princely way of talking and he looked at me and he said it's been 40 years since Raisin and the Sun the Broadway play that made him he said I want to go back to Broadway and I don't know where it came from but I said how about I write a play about Thurgood Marshall and said he looked at me and he said that would be wonderful uh, and so I wrote the play and Sidney and I rehearsed it in uh, my apartment in Los Angeles on several occasions. And then one day he said to me, he said, you know, I'm 75 years old. I've been trying to learn this play, and I can't learn it. You know, we can do it as a movie. And I said, well, we've really done the movie. So we moved on, and I next did it with uh, James Earl Jones in, uh, at the Newport Playhouse in Connecticut on our way to Broadway. But James Earl, in that case, 
also had a trouble trouble learning the play. Although he was able to do plays with actors, the idea of a solo play was difficult. And we eventually did it with Lawrence Fishburne, who turned out to be a perfect Thurgood. And we, we went to Broadway with Thurgood and had a wonderful success. And it's still being played around the country by different playhouses. Well, naturally, uh, Lawrence Fishburne is exceptionally, exceptionally talented. But uh, night after night, to be able to hear James Earl Jones with that commanding voice uh, delivering those lines must have been a treat. What's interesting um, uh, in that light, Mark, uh, Sidney and James Earl brought enormous gifts and reputation, but it turned out that Lawrence, who was in his 40s, was able to come out playing the older Thurgood and without any change of makeup, just taking his glasses and his attitude, then play the younger Thurgood through to becoming the Supreme Court Justice. So he brought uh, a special quality to it. Now, we've talked about all the different hats you've worn, writing and directing, producing. Um, when you're working on a project, do you have a preference on what you would like to do? Or do you like to wear as many hats as possible on each project you work on? Uh, it, it varies, case by case. I, mean, I, I wrote and directed uh, Separate but Equal. Uh, but in other projects, I, I write or co-write and produce. It, it varies from case to case. But always one is interested in the construction of the story because that's the heart of uh, of any of these visual mediums now going forward uh, we're talking about the other things you've done in addition to writing producing uh, directing um the afi or american film institute uh for those that are not as acquainted with it could you Kind of touch on it. What, what exactly um, its job is or the functions of the AFI, as well as how you got involved in, in helping to create it. The AFI was established um, to advance the art of film in the United States. And what that meant in, in those days was film preservation and film restoration, because half of the films that had been made were on nitrate, all were on nitrate stock and a great proportion of them were lost or missing. So working with other archives, we did a restoration project. There are now uh, 45,000 films in the AFI collection in the Library of Congress. Um, Also, the advancement of filmmakers, helping filmmakers be trained and make their way. And we started uh, the AFI Center for Advanced Film Studies in Beverly Hills in 1960. Nine at the Greystone Mansion there. It's now called the AFI Conservatory. But in that first class at AFI were Terrence Malick, Paul Schrader, Caleb Deschanel, the great cinematographer, and the next year, David Lynch. So for 50 years, the AFI Conservatory has been a, a, a training ground for, for, for new filmmakers. Writers, directors, That's... cinematographers, cameramen. Now, of course, beyond the AFI, you also were, were very instrumental in getting the Kennedy Center honors off the ground. Uh, can you discuss a little bit about uh, the genesis of, of that project? Uh, the AFI, when I was running it, uh, had its eastern office in the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, which was Kennedy's memorial. And I had done an event for AFI's 10th anniversary for CBS television that was very successful. And I went down the next day and said to the head of the Kennedy Center, uh, you ought to have your own show. And he said, do you have any ideas? And I said, the idea is carved in marble on the wall of this building, in the words of President Kennedy. And uh, President Kennedy had said, uh, I look forward to an America that won't be afraid of grace and beauty that will reward achievement in the arts the way we reward achievement in business and statecraft. And therein was the idea for honoring America's finest performing arts, for performing artists. And and we we began that, and I co-wrote and produced that for 37 years. Uh, Now, speaking of President Kennedy, you had mentioned that uh, you were uh, part of a project to um, uh, shoot a documentary or some film of uh, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy's trip 
to India. Uh, did you go along uh, with uh, the first lady on that trip? I, I didn't go on the trip, but we sent a co- film crew on the trip and made the film. Now, I'm curious, did you have any uh, relationship with or did you interact uh, regularly with the Kennedy family? I did. Making films for Ed Murrow, President Kennedy took an interest in the films we were making, and I would receive an occasional phone call from him reacting to one of the films we made and asking where it was being shown and uh, how many countries, what languages. And on another occasion, he called about a film called The Five Cities of June, which included his trip to Berlin, where he made his famous Ich bin ein Berliner speech beside the Berlin Wall in in 1963. Uh, and uh, and he, he'd called me to say, I think you ought to enter that film in the Academy Awards, which showed kind of that President Kennedy had all sorts of interests and appetites. You know, I'm thinking back to what you said about how your, your father believed that film should endure, you know, and you've had the opportunity to interact with uh, a wide range of folks and uh, actors like Sidney Poitier, um, you know, uh, the the films he's in definitely endure. And even for myself, I look back at films I enjoy with, let's say, like Cary Grant, you know, watching things he was in. Uh, I still very much enjoy them. And I think they they were you know, great commentaries uh, on the time and just, I think, wonderful works uh, of art, most certainly. Can I tell you a, a story um, uh, 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 relates to this? <clears throat> in 1951, I went to the Academy Awards with my father, uh, and I sat next to him, and Joseph L. Mankiewicz, writer, producer, had one a director had won last year's award and he was presenting it and he read the nominees John Houston The Asphalt Jungle William Wyler Detective Story Vincent Minnelli An American in Paris Elia Kazan A Streetcar Named Desire and George Stevens A Place in the Sun quite an array in one year and driving home the car the the Oscar was on the seat between us in the car and I remember my father looking over at me and saying we'll have a better idea what kind of a film this is in about 25 years and he was talking about the test of time you know he having come from the theater knew the importance of art lasting and uh, now he I'm certain he did not know that on that night in 1951 he was talking to the future founding director of the American Film Institute, but he was giving me an idea that was at the core of everything AFI did, the test of time when it comes to movies. You know, that that's that's wonderful. You know, that's so true. I mean, there are so many movies that, that, that maybe didn't even win an award uh, that not only stand the test of time, but uh, become even more appreciated as the years go on. Um, and, you know, you had mentioned the relationship you had to the Kennedy White House. And, and you, uh, from what I understand, you had relationships with other uh, other White House administrations. Now, you did have a relationship with the Obama administration as well, correct? I did. I was um, a very early supporter of President Obama and uh, and. We did eight years of Kennedy Center Honors together and uh, eight years of another show that I did called Christmas in Washington. So I have had the, uh, the pleasure of being associated with him. Now, that, that that's such a wonderful opportunity. I mean, for someone who makes movies and creates to be able to um, put some notches along the timeline, to document uh, American film and, and to uh, be a part of, you know, to, to some degree, uh, being a part of writing the creative history uh, of the U.S. Um, now, coming up, what were you watching? What what movies or uh, entertainment really captivated you uh, that, you know, I don't know if they necessarily inspired you, but what did you like to grab some popcorn, sit down and watch uh, when you were coming up? Uh, I had become acquainted with my father's work and and was admiring of the work of his colleagues and uh, the, on the waterfront and uh, from here to eternity and pictures like that were, you know, I favored the 
w- ones that were going to be classics, although I didn't know they were going to be classics. But my first kind of, we're looking back, where I realized I had my first instincts about film. We lived in Toluca Lake in North Hollywood, and uh, Dad had a 16-millimeter projector, and he taught me to thread it when I was 12 years old and to set up the screen on tripods. And he had prints of the movies that he'd made, and I looked at some of the Wheeler and Woolsey comedies. And uh, But along came, in 1939, Gunga Dean, a film with uh, Victor McLaughlin and Cary Grant and Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., a classic adventure comedy that took place in India. And I would thread that movie up, and I, I sensed the, a dimension in it. And at the center of it was Gunga Dean, the water bearer, the regimental beastie. And he wanted to be a soldier. And, you know, toward the end of the movie, he saves the res- regiment. And then at his funeral with wonderful Alfred Newman music playing, they have his burial and the British commander says, you're a better man than I am, Gunga Dean. And it was touching to a 12-year-old, and I think I started to develop a sensibility for films uh, at that time. Now, as we kind of bring it forward a little bit, um, going from the things you enjoyed, things that inspired you, um, and, and when you developed your sensibility for what good film was... If we were to look at, let's say, the last five to ten years uh, in theaters, uh, what have you liked to go see? What what kind of movies uh, or the performers, directors, who do you like to watch? What kind of films do you enjoy? Uh, well, I, I certainly like the Christopher Nolan films. I, 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 I loved James Campion's uh, picture this year. And also I, I was very attracted to Will Smith's Performance and the and the story in that in the picture about uh, the Venus Williams and her sister. Uh, so there is, there's an awful lot of fine work being done. I think too much of the investment in film is being devoted to the to the to the to the tent poles and the Marvel comics pictures, and so the filmmakers who are making more original and individual works sometimes are working with lesser budgets are in fact always are working with lesser budgets than my father and David Lean and uh, Alfred Hitchcock were now I think it was uh, Steven Spielberg uh, uh, some time ago had said or had alluded to uh, movies that will be coming out in theaters that there will probably be less and the ones that are going to show up are going to be the really big movies that will be in theaters uh, have a little little bit longer run time um, and that means less movies in theaters, more movies being released uh, in streaming and, and, and uh, for people to be able to watch at home. Do you have an opinion as far as uh, where movies are released? Do you think that there's something special about keeping more films in the theater or does it even make a difference? Well, I'm torn because I love the big screen. That's what I was raised on. Um, we just did a, a restoration premiere that Steven Spielberg and I presented together at Grauman's Chinese of Giant. Uh, and we were showing a film that premiered 65 years earlier in the same theater now with a new audience. And Steven and I, to watch this audience respond on an IMAX screen to this film, was really kind of a proof of that test of time. So I like the big screen, but I also see what streaming is doing in providing different opportunities for independent filmmakers and a diversity of filmmakers, and I think that's very valuable. So I hope that the big screen will restore its place in our lives and that we can continue to have the uh, films made for streaming and with more modest budgets that give opportunity to to new filmmakers. You know, I think there is something about the, uh, the the convenience of being able to watch something at home, the, the ability to see more uh, more films, uh, to expose more people to uh, a film. Uh, but there is something about that communal experience, about being in a theater, and, and some 
some movies, I think, are designed to be seen uh, and appreciated even more on a big screen, like Top Gun. I know it's kind of a popcorn film, but uh, it's anything James Cameron does, you know, the, the Avatar movies. You know, seeing them in a theater is, uh, I think it's, 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 it's a very cool experience and hopefully one that, uh, that, that holds on uh, for some time. Now, going forward, uh, I'm curious about your opinion about current trends, things that you like or, or things that maybe you would like to see change or um, something that maybe you're not a big fan of uh, when it comes to uh, making films and uh, things you think maybe need an update. Well, I'll tell you one, Mark. Um, I, I was just saying how many benefits uh, streaming, Netflix and uh, Disney Plus or whatever they call it, uh, it, it brings. Uh, but now they're talking about putting advertising into Netflix and Disney Plus. What I had to struggle against throughout my career was advertising, the mentality of advertising that governed the thinking of of commercial television, which was the best place for me to do certain of my work. And one of the blessings of streaming is that filmmakers have been doing wonderful work without interruption, long, sometimes 10-part dramas and I think it's really a danger if we're now going to start letting the advertising world control and influence uh, that form of filmmaking. It does seem to be a more symbiotic or a better relationship to just pay a subscription fee than receive the your entertainment, your content uh, commercial free. Uh, that does make a lot of sense. It took us a long way to get there and I don't want to see us turn back. Absolutely. Now, talking about your uh, new book, A Place in the Sun, uh, the memoir, uh, I'm curious, what got you to sit down and decide, you know, I want to write my own book. I want to put this together and uh, kind of recount stories and, uh, you know, kind of put it all out there uh, for people to read. What was the impetus for you deciding to write A Place in the Sun? I was aware that I lived an an exceptional life in many respects. And with me, it was mainly a question of whether I could be successful in making it a compelling uh, book and and with stories that uh, interested people. And so it was... uh, And writing it, I became aware that I have uh, led this blessed life where I've been involved with so many interesting and accomplished friends and colleagues and the fact that they're from the entertainment world from government from politics from sports uh, it just there's a richness that uh, that made me want to tell these stories and many of them are revealing about very interesting people Uh, so it's nice to have it between two covers now, earlier you had mentioned something about sports writing and uh, being intrigued by uh, following sports and baseball. And naturally, I've got to ask you, uh, uh, who was your team growing up? I'm assuming you're a Nationals fan right now. Uh, well, I, 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 I grew up on the Hollywood stars in Los Angeles that became the Brooklyn Dodgers. And living in Washington, I've had some very good years with the Nationals that seem to have ended uh, <laughs> but we won that national uh, the World Series and that was a great experience for people who have been mostly baseball starved in Washington well I'm a Texas Rangers fan so I'm I'm pretty used to to being disappointed you know <laughs> <laughs> you, you know I, I was curious about what your advice would be uh, to somebody who is looking to become a filmmaker or uh, actor, or let's say they already are, uh, the, the piece of advice or guidance that you would offer up. Um, I'm going back to what you mentioned about your father and watching him on a set and the way he interacted uh, with the actors and the way he treated them. Um, and that informed the way you approached uh, interacting with actors. Um, what piece of advice or what pieces of advice would you think are of value to a modern day filmmaker uh, and uh, or an actor and, and how they can best approach their career? I would say 
someone who wants to make films, to, to look at the great films, uh, the classic films, and also the new films that are carving new ground, because all of the lessons for filmmaking, about filmmaking, are in those films. Um, and for both actors and directors, you just have to believe in yourself and keep knocking on doors because the resistance to getting in a position to making uh, films. You mentioned in passing that uh, I had a, a well-known father and it was much easier for me to get in to see Jack Webb who gave me my opportunity because I was George Stevens Jr. But whoever you are, uh, and once I'd had that opportunity, I was knocking on doors to try and get the things made that I wanted to get made. So believe in yourself and just keep pushing your ideas and, and hoping that someday someone will open their eyes and say, yes, we want to do that. You know, I'm curious uh, who it is right now you're enjoying uh, watching uh, actors, uh, new actors, established, uh, either one, um, who you like to watch uh, on the big screen? You know, well, they're just, there's so many, but I don't think there's that handful of stars. You, you, and, and it's interesting because with so many independent films, there are new people, you know, and there were there used to be what nine major movie stars or the ten top movie stars now it's all across the board and uh, lesser known people are are doing great work yeah it's kind of like what you mentioned before uh, with streaming uh, there are just simply more opportunities for people to get projects uh, out and uh, and it's it's pretty much impossible to see everything that's uh, coming out now. So uh, there are so many uh, great projects, and I think that uh, it's it's not like the days gone by when there were bigger barriers to getting in the film. Now there's simply so many venues that it's a little easier for uh, I think people to percolate up and show up on screen that that uh, really have the talent. Um, now, is as far as your book goes, it's uh, it's available now. I'm assuming it's uh, already been released. Uh, my my place in the sun uh, is available right now. Correct in, in bookstores and uh, and you can find it on the internet. And uh, we've been having a wonderful response. Uh, I, I did an event at Politics and Prose uh, last Tuesday with Michael Beschloss, the great historian, uh, moderating it, and Tom Thomas Friedman interviewed it. And I'm going to be doing the 92nd Street Y in New York with Tom Brokaw on June 5th, which will be both in person and virtual. So I'm having a very good time uh, kind of telling these stories and uh, and getting the reaction from people to this book that I spent a good deal of time putting together. You know, something I, I so appreciate you uh, taking time out uh, to chat with me and uh, sharing your stories. Um, and uh, as we wrap up, I, I always love asking my my seven questions, uh, just to kind of a little extra get to know you. Um, and, and the first question I always like to ask is, what is your favorite comfort food? Um, that, that thing that you just really enjoy just uh, doesn't have to be good for you, <laughs> you know. Um, what do you like to eat? What is that kind of go-to comfort food for you? Yes, well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to avoid all of that stuff. Um, I, I guess I, 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 I like a little popcorn with my, um, my, my streaming. Well, absolutely. That's that's still pretty healthy. I know that uh, anytime I have any and I'm watching a movie, the uh, my golden retriever finds a way next to me because he he always gets at least a few kernels. Um, now, the next question I have for you, if you're going to sit down and have a cup of coffee, and let's say you got three people who uh, are going to be sitting down having coffee with you and it could be anybody. Who would you like to sit down and uh, share a conversation with for a few hours? Who are those three people? Sidney Poitier, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. 
very good. That sounds like actually a wonderful, uh, a wonderful conversation. Um, now I'm curious with uh, your time in Washington and with uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, did you have an opportunity to spend time with or, or converse with Robert Kennedy? Yes, I, 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 I write a great deal in the book about um, Robert Kennedy, who uh, oh, okay. I, I was close to and I admired greatly, and and I I, I would say that having endured the tragedy of President Kennedy's murder, uh, I think that Bobby's death was of even more consequence because we had survived uh, the Kennedy, John Kennedy assassination, and I really think Bobby was the person who could have brought this country together, his, his, his uh, comfort with working people, with minorities, uh, with young people. And he was just such an accomplished, and and uh, and had great uh, uh, ideals. You know, that's so wonderful that you have had the opportunity to speak with uh, and interact with um, a number of just really key uh, cultural, uh, political figures uh, in history. And I'm very much looking forward to reading your book because. Uh, um, Hearing more of these or reading more about these stories is uh, got to be a real treat. Now, um, the next question I have for you, and this is, of course, interesting because you've had the opportunity to work with such a constellation of, of people and meet them. Uh, coming up, who was your celebrity crush? You know, I was asked this by on another discussion, and having seen my first time on a sound stage was uh, at RKO when I was 12 years old, seeing Irene Dunn and Cary Grant getting on a train in Penny Serenade. So seeing movie stars never kind of gave that rush to me, even though you know Jimmy Dean, Elizabeth Taylor, and all these people became friends. And I, I was asked, you know, and, and I said... I didn't have a good answer for for what movie star affected me with that tickle on my neck. And then I came back three minutes later, and I said, I will tell you who my person for that was. And it was John Fitzgerald Kennedy. The first time I saw him in a room up close, it was the era of black and white television. And to see him come through the door in black tie on a wintry night and and just he just walked within three feet of me, but we didn't talk. But if that was as charismatic a figure uh, as I have met. And Muhammad Ali is somewhere <laughs> in that class. You know, that's such a, a very interesting point. Uh, in an era where everything on film, uh, on television, that's it's going to be black and white, everybody you meet... Uh, they're there not only in person but in full living color. That it's it's like seeing them um, really for the first time in a way. You know, growing up in era uh, in an era of uh, color television and film, you know, didn't uh, it probably is is not as poignant of an experience as as you probably had a number of times. Um, now the next question is: Now, if you're going to go, let's say, for a full year to a beautiful exotic island, uh, but you don't have internet, no streaming. Um, and you do have a DVD player and a CD player. And you can bring one album with you and you can bring one movie on DVD with you. What would that album be and what would that movie be for you? Well, if I'm going to be alone on the island, I think I'll bring the, 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 the Leontine Price's collection of arias because I think it will be very uh, soothing and moving. Um, and boy, that's you, you put one on the spot with a DVD because it is something I want to see over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm afraid that that would have to be my father's film, Shane. I can watch it from beginning to end and never, never not want to go back and see it again. Speaking of those uh, older movies, especially when they made the transition to uh, color, there was something about the cinematography there was, that was unique to the era. You know, thinking of uh, films kind of like 
uh, Lawrence of Arabia, for instance. Just there was something kind of grand and unique. And uh, 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 Lawrence of Arabia would would be on my list for that island. <laughs> oh, that would definitely be a good one. Now, the the next question I have for you uh, is if from the moment you wake up until you put your head down on the pillow at night, if you were to define what a perfect day would be for you, um, you know, what are the component parts of that perfect day? Uh, to get up and have something challenging to do that I'm working on, uh, to uh, g- give my best effort to that through the day, and at 4 o'clock go play nine holes of golf, preferably at the, at the National Golf Links in Southampton, um, and have dinner with my wife of 57 years. The last line in my book is uh, that I have lived a glorious life um, in the company of a woman who, in the Stevens vernacular, stands the test of time with grace and beauty, and having dinner with Liz is my enduring prize. Yeah, that is wonderful. Uh, we should all uh, we should all be so lucky. Um, now, the next question, you, you somewhat alluded to it earlier, but if you were not doing what you were doing for a living and if you didn't have the career you had, what would be the alternate uh, vocation for you? What would be the other thing that you would have liked to have done or that you would like to do for a living? Well, I don't. If, 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 I, I am a person of high aspiration, and I don't know. I certainly know I don't have the talent to be a tour golfer um, or or an opera singer. Uh, so I, I I think I would would disappoint you by saying I really think I found my path, and I'm very fortunate uh, that I ended up on a road where I had some uh, capacity to achieve and excel. I mean that's the that's the goal and aspiration I think we all have is to to end up doing that thing, uh, especially if we can do it for a living uh, that we love and that we have a, a, a an aptitude to do. Now the last question I have for you, uh, going to make a Back to the Future reference. Let's say you jumped into a DeLorean and you have two minutes with sixteen year old you. Uh, you have an opportunity to convey some advice, some wisdom, uh, guidance um, to put you younger you on a better path or to make life even a notch better. What is that bit of advice you would want to offer uh, to your sixteen year old self? Um, I would have liked to have been advised in a persuasive way to concentrate more and study more uh, in school and have more curiosity. I developed it later, but that would have, advice would have been very helpful to me uh, when I was 14. You know, it's funny. I think that applies to uh, all of us that entered into a creative field, or, or many of us. Um, yeah, I think the uh, thing that makes us uh, thrive creatively isn't the thing that necessarily helps in algebra class, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, uh, George, thank you so much uh, for taking time to talk story. And uh, this has been a real uh, pleasure and treat, uh, without a doubt. The new book, again, is My Place in the Sun, and I think everybody should go pick it up. It's a, um, it, it, I'm looking forward to being able to tap into uh, more of your history and the experiences you've had and um, just generally uh, kind of walk in your shoes for a brief moment. I wish you nothing but the best, and uh, best of luck with the release of your book. Great, Mark. My pleasure. Well, there you go. Hollywood legend George Stevens Jr. What an interesting uh, gentleman to speak with. And um, his new book, My Place in the Sun, well worth picking up. I mean, we had, what is this, about an hour chatting, uh, and we only, I feel, scratched the surface on the stories he has to tell. Again, My Place in the Sun, I'm going to be reading this because uh, after today, I've got a real appetite for uh, the stories uh, Mr. Stevens has to tell. Uh, Again, thank you, by the way, uh, for coming and checking out Story and Craft. And I've been getting getting some really wonderful messages. I appreciate it. If I have not had the opportunity to reply and say thank you, 
uh, in your email inbox. Your message is coming. Hang tight. I've uh, been getting a lot of wonderful uh, messages about the show, so thank you. Uh, next week, another great show. I'm planning, plotting, and stirring up mischief. All for you for uh, what we do every week right here on Story and Craft. And once again, the website, www dot story and craft pod dot com. I'm saying www because it irritates my youngest daughter Emma. She thinks that's ridiculous. I still say www. Uh, so there you go, Emma. Uh, okay, so uh, story and craft pod dot com. It's where you find out all the great stuff about uh, the show, what we got going on. You can sign up for the email newsletter and uh, shoot me a message if you like. Uh, also, social media, pretty much everything you want to know about the show. Is at storyandcraftpod.com. All right, that's it for this episode. I look forward to checking you out next week. Stop back by and uh, we'll talk story right here on Story and Craft. That's it for this episode of Story and Craft. Join Mark next week for more conversation right here on Story and Craft. Story and Craft is a presentation of Mark Preston Productions, LLC. Executive producer is Mark Preston. Associate producer is Zachary Holden. Please rate and review Story and Craft on Apple Podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. You can subscribe to show updates and stay in the know. Just head to storyandcraftpod.com and sign up for the newsletter. I'm Emma Dillon. See you next time. And remember, keep telling your story.